Jan Fischer, we are sitting uh, on, at the bottom of a, of a nice tree in Almavi. Tell us why you are here and um, yeah, what's the reason of your team being in Transylvania for, for almost five years now? Yeah, right. So um, we're doing a research project here. We're interested in all the changes taking place in the region, both from an ecological and a social perspective. So we're basically sort of taking what's called a social ecological approach, where we recognize the interrelations between people and nature. And we're trying to understand how all kinds of changes that are going on here now might shape the future of Transylvania, what this might mean for local people, and how this relationship between people and the environment is changing through time. It sounds uh, really complex. Now you are at almost at the end of the project, so to say. You are starting to present the outcomes of the, of the um, research. You have presented four scenarios of possible development. Could you tell me more about, about the outcomes generally of the project? Yeah, so um, I guess in general we looked at um, a whole range of different both social and ecological things and then we also try to bring them together in some sort of integrative exercises and these scenarios are part of that. So I'll explain the scenarios in a moment, but let's start with the ecological side. So on the ecological side we've studied something about plants, butterflies and bears and birds. On the social side we looked at um, how people perceive landscapes, what they'd like to see in the future in their landscape, what maybe are some obstacles to getting to those kinds of places where people might like to be. So those are some of the sort of social and ecological research themes. And on the integrative side, we've now conducted a process called scenario planning with something like 15 different expert groups from around the region. So that can be NGOs, church groups, um, different community organizations. And together with those people, we asked the question, Nobody knows what the future is going to look like, but let's think about it in a sort of structured way, and from that we can maybe get an understanding of what you can do to influence the future. So that's sort of the idea of scenario planning, that none of us know the future, but perhaps by thinking about it, we can position ourselves in a better way to basically face these uncertainties that might come in the future. And so we've constructed four scenarios, um, and those different scenarios um, are structured around two different kinds of uncertainties that we sort of distilled from our research might be particularly important in the future. One of those uncertainties is whether the sort of policy incentives in the future are going to be oriented more towards the economy, sort of a sort of narrow growth type paradigm, or whether these policy guidelines might perhaps be reoriented more towards the environment and towards sustainability. That's one major axis of uncertainty about the future. On the other axis, we have a local axis of uncertainty. So will local people get along? Will they basically get together in community groups and farmer associations and kind of work together for a better future? Will there be a strong civil society? Or on the other hand, will there be, say, a lot of corruption? Will people fight a lot? Will there be a lot of disagreements? Will people not participate in democratic fora? So those kinds of things um, could also make a big difference in the future. And so if we combine these kind of external uncertainties with those internal uncertainties, we end up with different scenarios of the future, which paint a very different picture of how the future might be. And what we're trying to do at the moment is take people through these scenarios in various outreach activities to get them to think about what their role might be in shaping the future. Okay, what about the scenarios themselves? Mm -hmm. So there are four different scenarios, and um, maybe I'll just go through one by one. One of them is called prosperity through growth. This is um, the kind of scenario where you have pro-economy settings, and at the same time you have civil society and communities being quite organized. And what you then get is, if you think this through, is you probably end up with development a little bit like what we've already seen in Western Europe. So basically, natural capital, meaning um, the biodiversity of the landscape, the small fields and so on, that's probably going to suffer a bit, but probably people are going to have better roads, better schools. Um, overall, the communities will start to look more like what we see in Western Europe. So the natural capital would decline in this scenario, but a lot of other indicators of social well-being would probably improve. So that's the prosperity through growth scenario. But now think if you had organized communities just in the same way, but policy settings were actually not favoring the economy, but were really thinking about the environment and sustainability. 
from that, just by thinking it through logically, we get to a scenario that we call somewhat, I, I guess, sort of idyllically, balance brings beauty. But the idea here is that we're not sort of trying to get the most money out of the landscape, but rather we're trying to balance the natural environment and people's well-being. So this kind of development might mean that we have, for example, ecotourism. We might have specialty products um, that are organically produced in this region and can be marketed. Um, we might have vineyards again, for example, which were there in the past, but many of them now are no longer there. So that's the kind of um, alternative where people probably wouldn't be quite as wealthy, but perhaps as a package they'd still have a very viable livelihood and um, basically the environment would be a lot better off. So it's another kind of future that people can think about, is that what they want? And some local NGOs, for example, think that that is indeed the kind of future they would like to see. So that's the scenario. Um, that's the scenario, um, balance brings beauty. Then, on the other hand, now let's think about what would happen if we have a pro-economy setting, but local communities are caught up in strife, there's corruption, and basically civil society is very weak. Well, that actually, if you think it through, could be quite a bad scenario. And what we call the scenario is our land, their wealth. What we predict would happen under such circumstances is that probably foreign investors would find this area very attractive, would potentially buy large amounts of land or lease it, um, effectively the same outcome. And essentially local people would get very few benefits from this. So not only would the environment suffer just like in the scenario of prosperity through growth, but on top of that the benefits would probably not go to the local people, but rather would go to these foreign investors who would basically make money out of the local landscape. What wouldn't be quite as bad is if local communities are not very well organized and this comes together with pro-environment policy settings. In such a case, we call it missed opportunity. Essentially, people really could have created a really exciting kind of combination of sustainable livelihoods, but they didn't. And perhaps the occasional European company will come in and sort of create um, organic, large organic farms, again with limited benefit to the local people. So those are four different kinds of futures. We're not saying any of these are particularly likely or in fact that any of these are what is going to happen. But we use these to basically play through different options of what might plausibly happen in the future. And that in turn might get people to think about the different kinds of benefits and um, disadvantages of different options and therefore what is their role in all of this. Okay. Do you want to say more about the theoretical approach? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, the scenarios, I don't know that I need to, we've not done that, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we can say something about the overall social, ecological, what is a social, eco so, yeah, the, so you, you sort of, yeah, so I can say our research takes a blah, blah, blah approach and then explain that a bit if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the approach Do, do you your think research? I talk too long in one hit or is it okay like that? For me it's okay. Okay. So, yeah, what, mm -hmm. what was your approach? Mm -hmm. So our research takes um, what we call a social, ecological approach. And that means it's a little bit different from sort of traditional academic work. A lot of traditional academic work is very much discipline oriented. So you're a biologist, you do biology. Or you're a social scientist, you do social science. If you're an anthropologist, you do anthropology and so on. And we try to sort of blend together different elements that are relevant um, both from the social and the ecological side. And that's a little bit different in our work. So it's called a social ecological systems approach because we recognize that basically people and the environment are intricately interconnected. So people, if you think of it as sort of two poles, people affect the environment through how they use it, but the environment in turn gives people something back. It gives them fresh air to breathe, fresh water to drink, gives them all kinds of goods and services, as it's now called. Also, the scenic beauty that you get from nature. So these things are now called ecosystem services often. And so a social ecological approach very much puts at the center of the attention um, these interrelationships between people and nature. And it's quite a different way of working from what traditional scientists often do. The other thing that's a bit different about our work is that we try to the best of our abilities to involve local people in some of these questions that we're asking. That's actually quite difficult to do and it's particularly difficult in a society like Romania where people are not so used to, say, workshops and working with people in sort of um, these kind of democratic fora where they're given a voice. 
So this has been quite challenging for us as well, but to the best of our abilities, we try to kind of connect with people and stakeholder groups throughout our research process. Okay, mm, tell me something about your experiences here. Mm -hmm. So Romania has been a fascinating country to work in and we've had many interesting and wonderful experiences and some very frustrating ones as one would expect. I think what's interesting is that at the sort of local government level in some places people are very interested, in other places they're very much not interested and I think we'd expect some of this kind of heterogeneity. What overall I found most fascinating is that the kinds of relationships that have long been lost in places like Western Europe between people and the environment, many of these are still very much alive today. So people know about the benefits from nature, they know where to find mushrooms, where to find fresh water and so on, but they also know about the disbenefits. They know about the fact that there might be bears in the forest and that might be dangerous and so you have got to deal with it. If you're a shepherd, that means you have a large number of dogs and you protect yourself. And so basically there are all kinds of systems in place to live with nature that have been lost in many places like Western Europe. And I think one general thing we can learn from a system like this one in central Romania is to look at the kinds of properties of these social ecological systems of how come that people manage to coexist with nature quite successfully here. So we don't want to sort of maintain the past because obviously people want to develop into a different kind of maybe more prosperous future but what are the key properties of how people interact with nature that we don't want to forget about in the future as well.